Now I'll add in the spine, and the spine works a little bit differently than the other bone chains in XSI. Sure, we could go in and just use a 2D chain and start from where we think our character would bend and add in a few bones to represent the spine, but the problem here is if we used forward kinematics, we can only pivot uh, from, from the hips. We can't get S-curves generated from the rib cage down, in other words, reversing the effect. So for that I'm going to use a built-in tool in XSI that's found under the Create Skeleton menu called Create Spine. Now what this requires is two control objects to help build the effect. And the most important thing about those two control objects is to ensure that their local Y axes are pointing along the length of the spine. So if you're creating something like a quadruped whose spine is horizontal, you would need to make sure that local Y runs horizontally as well. You can't just leave Y pointing upwards. Otherwise, you're going to get some very strange um, behavior when you, uh, when you animate the spine. So the control type objects I'll use to build this spine are base layer controls. In other words, I'm going to use them to create the effect, but I'm not going to use them to animate the character. And we want to maintain some kind of a consistency with the type of objects we use for control objects. So for controls, just the first layer uh, of the rig, I can use implicit objects. Now implicits are a little bit different than polygon mesh or curve objects of the same type, you know, circles um, we can get as implicits as well. Implicits just have no geometry attached to them. They're basically a glorified center pivot. So we can save polygons so we don't have to contribute to the, uh, the processing of the the character when we render it, and they're also invisible to the renderer, so no real extra overhead. The object type I'm going to use to represent my uh, my base layer control is just an implicit cube. We could use something like a torus as well if we wanted it to be very different, but a cube is going to be something I can use to start off with. Uh, I'm going to use the size attribute over the scale attribute because again we want everything to remain uniform, and if I were to scale my implicit object down, I have a non-100% scale, which I would then be tempted to go in and freeze, but if you freeze the scaling of an implicit object, it just reverts back to its original size. So it's much easier to use the length attribute to make the object smaller without actually affecting the scale transform. So I'll place that box sort of right where I want the deformation to start. So starting deep down here in the pelvic area. Below the belly line. Make that a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to duplicate it to make the end point of the spine, sort of the, where it meets the chest. So I'll control D to duplicate that. And I'll slide that up right to where the ribcage chain begins. Can move it back a little bit as well too. This character has a fairly aggressive arc to its body, but that's okay. We can adjust the spine once we've built it. So to invoke the spine now, to build it, we'll create a skeleton and we'll use the create spine tool. And if we look down at the mouse command line, you can see in green at the bottom of your interface we're in a pick session, and to the right of the green bar we have the left, middle, and right mouse button prompting us to choose a, a hip object. So I'll left click and pick my hip object. And once I've satisfied that requirement, I'm asked to pick a chest object, so I'll just click on that. And this brings up the spine maker attribute editor. So how many vertebra do I want to represent this area between my hip and the chest icon? I'm going to use three. That should be enough to account for a pretty nice deformation through here. And I'm also going to make those icons implicit vertebra. So again, like these icons are implicit, I also want the vertebra to be implicit. So I'll press OK, which will build the spine. And right now, the spine is composed of a couple extra things. Uh, I'm going to switch the Explorer to an objects only filter. And let's just explore what we've done here. So the cube objects that we've built now have a couple of extra controls added to them. One is an item called hip depth, the other is called chest depth. Really what these are doing is they're controlling points on a curve. You can see that a spine curve has been created and if I was to just use the modify component move point tool for a moment, 
we can zoom in and see that there are one, two, three, four points making up this curve. And with a four point curve, you can get quite a lot of flexibility in it. And you'll note that the cube, the hip depth, the other cube, and its chest depth are placed or controlling the points of the curve. So if I move the chest depth, we get a change in the shape. So I can use it to kind of adjust the curvature of the spine. But these icons are a little ugly and a little unwieldy, so I'm going to select both the hip depth and chest depth, which are nulls, you can see the symbol, and I'm going to change the primary display icon of the null. Again, I got this window up just by pressing enter with both objects selected, and I'm going to change that icon over. I'm going to make it look uh, just a little bit different, um, because these are slightly different controls. I tend to use little pyramids to, to represent these objects, and their size is a little large, so I'm going to reduce their size a little bit as well. So we have these large controls that if I move them around control the articulation of the spine. Notice if I pull the controller too far it separates from the spine. So if you were parenting things to this uh, spine object we wouldn't want to parent them to this uh, cube object or this lower cube object. Um, well the lower cube object doesn't matter because it's stretching from the top, but definitely we don't want to parent objects to this uh, this upper control here. Instead, we would use the top vertebra element, and we can find that underneath the spine curve, vertebra 0 through 3. If I look in the front view, everything lines up as would be expected. The one thing I try and do with the spine once I create it is I try and gather all of the controls of the spine, so the cubes and the spine itself, under a common hierarchy because they're just a little bit too loose for my liking. So I have three separate hierarchies. If I select the top node in each of the three hierarchies, I can create a transform group, basically a null that is the parent of them. And the nice thing about transform groups is that they don't show up in the renderer, so it doesn't add any visual, or sorry, in the in the OpenGL viewport. So it doesn't add any extra complexity, visual complexity to the scene. Um, I can do that by using shift uh, question mark or shift forward slash. Uh, if we want to use the edit menu, you can also do it by creating a transform group here. So the difference between a group and a transform group is just that this is a hierarchy based way of uh, organizing objects and this is just taking objects that you want to isolate specific properties on and manage them through the use of groups and again we have our groups here in the Malcor model. So I'm going to rename this uh, transform group because that doesn't really help me too much. I'm going to call this my spine parent null and I usually keep that word parent null in objects that represent the top of hierarchies if I'm just using it as an organizing tool Again, it's that filtering method, much like I call my geometry geo uh, appended to the end here. So we've got a number of hierarchies that are not quite related to one another yet, uh, and eventually we'll do that, but first we'll continue drawing the rest of the skeleton.